Hey, this is Joshua Austin. I'm here with Dentistry IQ Product Navigator Newsletter, and we're here talking about sleep disordered breathing with Dr. Dan Bruce. Uh, Dan is a diplomat in the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine. He's in private practice in Boise, Idaho, and he lectures uh, on the topic of sleep disordered breathing and the treatment of that um, in his office in, in Boise. Uh, Dan, thanks for, for joining us tonight. I know you're, you're busy. you got a family and, and a practice, so I appreciate you spending a few minutes with us. Um, you know, in my view, sleep disordered breathing has really changed how I look at occlusion and occlusal disease. Do you have the same kind of feeling, and do you look at things differently now that you know as much about sleep disorder breathing as you do? Yeah, I definitely do. I mean, the, the first thing is kind of looking at the role of the tongue and also, you know, how how airways have developed over um, as people grow up. And if the tongue's not in the right place uh, when they grow up, then they've got to find a place for that tongue to be. So if the mouth doesn't get big enough, the tongue's got to go somewhere, and it can have huge impacts on, on the teeth, you know, whether it be uh, pushing teeth out of the way or causing, um, you know, in my opinion, can, can, cause, can be involved with tooth sensitivity, sometimes have fraction abrasion lesions, um, all those things. Plus, you also have, you know, pretty good evidence supporting bruxism associated with sleep-related breathing disorder events. So... Um, a lot of times you see those patients that are in pain, having bruxism issues and occlusion issues, and and uh, them just trying to keep their airway open can be part of the problem. Right. Now, you wrote an article in a recent uh, issue of Dental Economics, and part of what you talked about was your experience, I believe, with your son. Is that correct? And, and sort correct. of just being the cue for you to, to get more educated about sleep disorder breathing. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah, sure. That's, true. that's a, you know... Originally, when, when uh, my son Luke, he's six now, but when he was born, he had a pretty tight uh, lingual freedom. And so we initially thought that, well, if he can nurse, then that's okay. Um, but as he grew up, he wasn't able to get his tongue to the top of his mouth, and I think that caused him to do some mouth, some mouth breathing, in addition to maybe some, some allergies and things. So um, as he was breathing through his mouth, we noticed he, he was snoring a little bit, and... Um, Right behind me, right there, trying to sneak up on me. Okay, there he is now. He's a he's a good-looking kid now. But hey, bud, are you are you breathing through your mouth now? That's right, because we've trained you, haven't you? Where's your tongue go? Right behind the front teeth, right? Mm -hmm. Good. So now he's sleeping much better. He's uh, I think he's doing better in school, don't you think too? Yeah. Back in school. Yeah. Yep. So it, uh, we got his adenoids taken out to allow him to breathe through his nose, and now he's he's sleeping much better, and um, you know it's going to help him give him a head start as far as getting his airway developed going forward. Right. You know, in my practice, I see a good amount of patients who I know have obstructive sleep apnea, but they don't have any idea, and that's not why they came to the dentist. Um, and and they're not used to hear, or they're not expecting to hear about that. You know, when they come in for a, a new patient exam or consultation or whatever. Um, do you have the same experience? I mean, I feel like I get some resistance from patients and just not expecting to hear about this. And how do you deal with kind of breaking that barrier for patients who aren't necessarily receptive to having that conversation about, about sleep? I think, I mean, I totally agree with you. I think that's been one of the most difficult things. Ricky, can you please go sit down there? Please. Thank you. Lukey, right over there on the, right over there, bud. You don't like attention, do you? So, no, I, Josh, I totally agree with you. Um, I think a lot of it, you know, when I first started learning about it, I was kind of gung-ho. People are going to be excited. They, you know, maybe they know why they're on high blood pressure medication now. They, they're going to be excited. This is why they have, you know, diabetes or why they're having these, you know, these uh, arrhythmias. And so I was kind of gung-ho into it. But people are, you're right, they're not necessarily ready to have that conversation. With patients who, who you know, you see the signs, you know, they've got all the anatomical signs plus the health history signs. And oftentimes, you know, I'll, I ask questions, you know, do, do you snore? Do you, um, do you feel tired, fatigued, or sleepy most days? And so people say, well, yes, I do, but, you know, my work schedule's hectic, I'm stressed out. Um, or yes, I do, but that's pretty normal. I, mean, I just turned 50. That's, you know, they, they just don't expect to have that conversation. So, um, oftentimes, I will just go about it saying, you know, you have the risk factors for this certain disease. It doesn't necessarily mean you have it, but uh, 
I'd recommend you know thinking about it if you if you do want to have a conversation with a, a sleep specialist that can send you the right place. If you want to just think about it too, I also often recommend uh, Sleep Interrupted by Dr. Stephen Park, and so that's just explains in pretty real in uh, very good terms how how sleep disturbances can affect all sorts of issues from thyroid to depression to anxiety all that kind of stuff and so um, you're right people just don't expect their dentist to say that and so but but on the other hand when we know we, we have to give them at least the the information that we have so I did have one patient who I've been talking to her for about four years I finally got her in for a sleep study and she only had mild apnea like a seven HI of seven so apnea index of seven um, but we got her into an oral appliance, and she said, you know, for the first time, I feel like my tongue fits in my mouth. And so it was a, it was a big deal for her. And, you know, when you've got that trust and you know, patients know that you care about them and that you're actually um, – this isn't just something you heard about, but it's something that you devote your practice to, then it, it, uh, it works for them. Good. Uh, one, co one question I commonly get from colleagues who, who maybe don't know as much about sleep disorder breathing is – uh, all about appliances. What appliance do I like? And and really, from my experience, that's almost inconsequential. There's about 19 things before appliance type that that really matter when you're talking about treating this stuff. Do you feel the same way? I mean, I kind of feel like a the, the type of appliance you use is really irrelevant in in the grand scheme of of screening and and talking to patients about it and getting people to sleep positions and all that kind of stuff. What are your thoughts? No, I totally agree. I mean, a lot of it is all the appliances generally do the same thing. I mean, you're advancing the mandible, um, but you're also you're looking at uh, comfort. Are you looking at can the patient use it? Are you looking at in the case of Medicare, is a medic you know sometimes insurance plays a role in it. Um, it has to be approved. Uh, so, a couple things I look for. I like things, something that's comfortable, easy to use, and I want something that's going to provide a lot of tongue space. So I, I you know. If it's not comfortable, they're not going to use it. Um, but you're right, it's really, are they screened properly? Do they have proper expectations? Are they willing to look at, you know, the other things such as positional therapy or weight loss or all of the, you know, assessing the reflux disease, all that stuff that, that needs to happen concurrently to really get better for them. Um, have you been able to convert some of your patients who are referred to you for sleep appliances into full-time dental patients? And do you have any tips on good ways to do that? So, so yeah, about a third of my practice is sleep now, and the rest of it's general dentistry. So, um, you know, the best way we've had success with is just on our intake forms, we ask who their general dentist is. And if, uh, you know, you definitely don't want to, to press them and try to convert them, but if you, you show them that you do a good job, you pay attention to all these different things, and then, you know, we're also taking a panoramic radiograph or, or some sort of uh before we do the before we do the oral appliance, and so it's a good chance to take a look at some things, you know, say, well, maybe you might want to get this done before you get your appliance because, you know, while we can adjust it after you have a crown or a filling or something, it's easier just to get your teeth in good, solid condition before you do it. So that is by far our biggest, my biggest source of new patients, um, and sometimes I'm ready to do the appliance, they come in and need all sorts of dental work, which is a good problem to have, um, but it's... I guess the tips are just go slow and just make yourself self available, and uh, it's it's worked out pretty well for us because a lot of these patients come in they haven't seen a dentist for three or four years, and this is just a good chance for them to get it all done in one place. Sure. Yeah, and I think not being super high pressure about switching or whatever, um, yep. I, I think is a good stance to take for the most part. So so those are those are really good tips. What has been your experience dealing with medical insurance to get reimbursed for, for appliances? I find that to be the biggest roadblock. I get a lot of people sort of up to that line, and then the medical insurance comes in, and, you know, that's that's where stuff goes astray. So tell me kind of what, what your experience has been with that. You know, when we first started, we thought we, we had somebody who had a couple of years of medical billing experience, but it was all billing in-network appliances, and so billing out-of-network is a whole different ballgame. And so we ended up uh, losing a fair amount of money starting on that. Now I think, you know, it's, it's become a pretty good standard of care that it's, it's an option for the right patients. And so most, most insurance plans are paying for it. Um, we have someone who has plenty of experience with medical billing, and so that's been very helpful. Um, 
I think if you're just starting into it, you know, getting involved with the medical billing company really helps. Um, you know, we're, we're involved with Dental Writer for our notes and things. There's other billing services out there that, that do a good job, but we always ask the questions, um, ask them questions about billing and, and how, it's, how things are supposed to be covered. But for the most part, it's been pretty well, I mean, it really helps patients out, whereas it used to be something you just had to pay for out of pocket. Right. Uh, I really appreciate you spending some time with us. I, I loved the cameo from your son. Uh, you know, that's, that's, and especially since he, he was a, a, a dental sleep patient for you um, and, and, and kind of the impetus to, to get you going. Congratulations yeah. on getting your diplomat in the AADSM last year. I think it's a really big deal, um, and, and that's, that's a step that, that I admire uh, that you've taken, and, uh, and, and congratulations on that. So thank you very much for, for joining us. I, I, think it's, I think it's been really informative, and, and, and hopefully uh, that people out there will think the same. I, I want to give a plug to your website and, and your sleep classes. Um, so if, if those of you out there are, are interested in learning more about, about dental sleep medicine, uh, check out BoiseDentalSleepTherapy.com. Um, I, I think, you know, Dr. Bruce is, is a great resource and, and quite honestly a, a, a great person to learn from, you know, if you're interested in getting into these. So, uh, Dan, thank you so much for spending time with us. I really appreciate it. Go hang out with your son. Uh, go, watch, go watch a movie, and uh, I hope you have a good night. Okay. Yeah, you too. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, man. Have a good night. Thank you, too.